<clears throat> the views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of any major corporation whatsoever. So, so now, uh, kids and lady kids, cough, cough, cough. This is the beginning of the segment. It's time once again to get out your Trapper Keepers and your Lisa Frank folders and, of course, your Frank Stallone erasers <laughs> that all kids cannot be without. Because it's what, Maxwell? No, 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 no. You can't interrupt me every 10 minutes with a special guest. I'm trying to rip through this. There's a time limit thing. Uh, I have to try and be done with this podcast before Supernatural comes on because Mommy freaking loves Supernatural and it's the two-hour season finale tonight. So I don't. I know you don't fully understand this because you're five, but I'm just trying to rip through this podcast so that I can uh, um, take care of you kids while Supernatural is on because it's Mommy's special time. Okay, so. Uh, you can't interrupt me every five seconds with a guest. Uh, we can, we'll have this guest on, but you, I'm just gonna have to bump you. I'm gonna bump you, Maxwell. I'm gonna bump you to later in the podcast. Okay? <laughs> okay. Is that all right? Okay. My apologies to Matt Damon. So uh, it's homework time once again here on the Pope on Film podcast, and this week we are going all the way back to our first homework assignment ever. Interestingly enough, our first homework assignment happened way back in episode. I have no fucking idea, and I'm not looking yes. it up. This is episode 125, so there is no way I am fact-checking my brown ass through 125 goddamn episodes. To <laughs> we did our first homework assignment. Also, while we're on the subject, this is our homework segment and not our very popular notes from the bookstore segment, and my son left the room. So in that case, damn cut cunt, shit, bitch, ass, balls, motherfucker, cocksucking, motherfucking piece of shit, Donald Trump. With that out of the way, uh, <laughs> our, our first homework assignment our first homework assignment was an episode of the original 1966 Ultraman show from Japan and it featured a magical stone. Oh, oh magical stone. Yes. Change into a liquid. And the black uh, it could eye. change into things like a Japanese yeah, it could change into things like a Japanese bride or a red liquid or a piano made of plywood. Uh, eventually, a crippled bad guy turns it into a monster, and it's the stupidest freaking monster this side of <laughs> Jar Jar Binks. We'll speak. We're going back to that weirdo space show with the second ever episode of Ultraman. This week's homework on YouTube. It's an English dub. It's Ultraman 1966. Episode two, and this is some kooky, kooky shiznittle. This was not as as ridiculous as that later one. Like no, you know, no, if no, it is. I was kind of watching it, and and I was like, you know, if you kind of put the cultural stuff aside, you know, and what they may think is funny and stuff like that. It's not terribly much different than like an episode of Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea or Lost yeah. in Space. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, it does have some serious sci-fi moments, but, but there is a bit of kookiness, especially with uh, the, what's his name, Ide? Yes. And black guy and all of that, at times, especially when he's involved. There are times when this feels like Japanese Scooby Doo, but with a short shorts, snot nosed kid named Hoshino in the place of a pot smoking dog with an eating disorder. <laughs> this is one of my favorite worst episodes of Ultraman. Before we go any further, we should talk a bit about the history of Ultraman and yes. the absolute best way to explain Ultraman and his popularity in Japan and his staying power, because he's been on the air for frickin' forever, is by drawing a line between Ultraman and another ridiculously long-running sci-fi show, Doctor Who. Yeah. Or as some of you may know it, Inspector Spacetime. <laughs> we can go anywhere in time and space, but it'll probably just be London during the Blitz. Yes. Surprisingly <laughs> enough, Ultraman and Doctor Who have a lot in common. For example, 
Ultraman began life as a fairly childish kiddie show before exploding into a long-running sci-fi juggernaut. And in much that same way, Doctor Who began life as an unwatchable black-and-white test pattern to yeah. scare those away from British crops. <laughs> Not sure if you know that the original episodes were in black and white and they were unwatchable. Yes, and only created to scare British crows away. Any of the few I've seen have yes, they indeed have been unwatchable. Yeah, uh, both shows started off as started off as cheap science fiction shows that no one had any great faith in, and yet survived through numerous revisions after decades on the air. And somehow are still on the air today and are still beloved by fans that could easily describe both Doctor Who and Ultraman. There have been numerous different Ultramen and yes. uh, different, different itinerations, and it's been updated. And, and there are movies, so many Ultraman movies. One came out in 2016. Really? Uh, the last one. Yeah, the last one came out in 2016. And it featured, uh, I, I'll, I'll get to that, I'll get to that. Ultraman features a character, uh, features a lot of uh, characters and monsters uh, that are uh, just men in rubber suits. Uh, yeah. A guy in a cheap outfit fighting a rubber suited monster. In that same light, did you know? I'm not sure if you do, but I'm such a Doctor Who fan that I obviously know this. The fourth Doctor, Kenny Baker? Um, Is that his name? No, Tom Baker. Tom Baker, there you go. I knew it was a baker. He was actually a Japanese man in a rubber suit. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, I did know that. No, I did, I, that, that explains his... What? Yet no one looks like Tom Baker in real life. No, and, and, that's and why if you Tom look Baker at him, was just a guy in a suit. He looks like his skin doesn't quite fit right. And that's why. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. His skin looks exactly like his overcoat. Yeah. Just, just, it just doesn't fit right. Did you hurt yourself? How did you hurt yourself, Maxwell? You hurt your tooth on the door? Oh, have mommy kiss it. She'll make it better. And she can check on your tooth to make sure that it's okay. And finally, both Doctor Who and Ultraman had really cheap-looking bad guys appear early on in their first itineration, yes. only to have those cheap-ass-looking bad guys in eventually become the series' most beloved and well-known villains. Really? For Doctor Who, it was the Daleks, which were basically just trash cans. Yeah. And and they were in what the second story arc ever of Doctor Who. I think so. Yeah. So for Inspector Space Time, of course, that was the Blorgons that they were always fighting. And for Ultraman, their most well-known bad guys, who just appeared in the 2016 big bulge, big budget Ultraman movie. Ultraman's most beloved bad guy is this week's freaking homework. Oh God. These guys are to Ultraman as the Daleks are to Doctor Who. And the reason is because of what happens at the end of this episode. Okay. So, so, so this episode begins with resident comic relief E-Day explaining how he got his black eye. It Don't is, it is amazing to me how, how quickly my brain is rejecting this episode. As I am having a hard time, what? As I'm ha having a hard time remembering what happened, and I watched it just before we started the show. Yeah, yeah, it's a weird ass episode, and it's difficult to to kind of put your finger on it. But Maxwell and Bella and I have watched it so many freaking times that it's just this episode is just burns into my brain. So. Ide is trying to explain how he got his black eye. Don't listen to him. The story is not about Ide's eye at all. He is lying. Yes. Plus, I don't like the fact that he's getting all, I don't like the fact that he's getting all Jared Fogel about it. Yes. I'm going to tell you a story. It's a secret, okay? Don't tell any about anybody about this. This is just between you and me, okay? It's like, damn, old Trump man, I needed this episode. 
Because you are really creeping me out here. <laughs> you are really creeping me the hell out. So the real story concerns a nondescript building where guards are being frozen in kooky, unnatural positions. Uh-huh. So the science patrol is called in to investigate. Yes. So science patrol member Oki heads to the scene. And, of course, annoying child Brad Hoshino tags along. But it's important to remember Japanese Japanese history. I've watched a lot of Japanese movies and Japanese TV shows, and one uh -huh. thing I have learned about Japanese history is that back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, everyone in Japan was forced by law to have an annoying child tag along. <laughs> that is just fact. <laughs> That's the one thing I learned about Japanese culture from watching all of their stuff. There is always a bratty child in the mix. Yes. Mm, we need to destroy this giant turtle. What's that six-year-old boy? We shouldn't. Okay, then. We have, to, uh, we have to do what you say by law. This makes sense. We're in Japan. Yeah. So uh, the real plot is that there's an alien race called the, the, the Baltan, the Balton. Uh, that's the name of the alien, and it's also the name of the alien race. So this alien can freeze people. Yes. He can also, like, turn into them, take over their body. And he can split into multiple decoys, like Ken Jeong's G.I. Joe character from Community. <laughs> so the Altan home planet was destroyed, so they shrunk to minuscule size. They can change their size, too. And they all, like, 150 billion of them, I forget the number, but a ton of them, the entire race got into a spaceship... And that spaceship came to Earth to cohabitate with us. Okay. And it shouldn't be a problem because they're like minuscule size, but the science patrol says, hell no, and they get into a fight. Okay. But here's the kicker. Here, here's, the important, here's the important part, and here, here's the reason why this stupid character from episode two of Ultraman became the most well-known villain in the Ultraman world. So... The fight ends with Ultraman not only defeating the alien, but also committing genocide. <laughs> because the alien says, my entire race is in a spaceship, and the spaceship is invisible right outside of the Earth's atmosphere. So what does Ultraman do? He says, I've defeated this alien, and now I'm going to go fly into space, and hey, I found out where your invisible spaceship is. Ha! I'm going to blow the shit out of it. <laughs> and he blows up the ship with an entire race of aliens in it. <laughs> and there's all happy music and shit. They're like, doo -doo 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 -doo. Ultraman, save the day by committing mass genocide. <laughs> That's literally how the, 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 the episode ends. The episode ends with Ultraman just the spaceship with the entire race inside of it. You just committed genocide. <laughs> what the hell, Ultraman? This is only episode two. You're really weirding us out here. <laughs> creepy just trying to hit it on the audience, and now you just committed mass genocide. Well, so obviously, obviously, he did not get all of them. There must have been another ship. Yeah, so so this is the birth of the Baltan, the Baltan as the ultimate enemy of the Ultraman, because some Baltan survive, and they head to a, a, a nearby alien uh, planet, and they prepare their revenge against Ultraman. As you Ultraman. would. <laughs> yeah, and, and all the Ultraman and the Ultra Force, because literally you killed, like, the majority of my people. So now you are our ultimate enemy, and we will try and kill all of you. Yes. And they're not freaking wrong in <laughs> <No>. this. <laughs> in the right. So I actually own... Both the first run of Ultraman and the second run of Ultraman, which was uh, Ultra 7. So, so yeah, a, a, anyway, Ide got his black eye because he fell off of his bed at Science Patrol. So, uh, a, a, he his 
Black Eye is in no way related to the Monster of the Week. And never again does a character talk directly to the camera. In this first itineration of Ultraman, which was from 66 to 67, and it ran for 39 episodes, and I own all of them, right before Borders Bookstore closed down, I bought the entire 39-episode run of Ultraman at Borders for $5. Because that's how little... Because that, that's how little know or care about Ultraman in America. Yeah. That I bought an entire run of the show for $5. And you can still find it on the internet for ridiculously cheap, and it's amazing. It's all dubbed in English. I also bought the follow-up 1967 show, Ultra 7. Ultra 7 was a bit more serious than the original Ultraman, and because of that, the Ultra 7 version of Ultraman is considered the most popular version of Ultraman. Uh huh. Okay. Is Ultraman so in it? Ult- um. Well. Uh. What. What. After the first run of Ultraman, there are a, a Ultraman is a member of a series of protectors of the galaxy called the Ultraman, the Ultra Force. Okay. And so each version of Ultraman has just a different Ultraman from the Ultra Force in it. And it wasn't for it wasn't until a couple of runs down that you saw like the third run of Ultra Man featured Ultra 7 in it. So then the fourth run of Ultraman featured Ultra 7 and featured the original Ultraman and so that kept happening over and over again. Yeah. So uh, it took a while for all the different Ultramen to show up. But in every version of Ultraman, the Baltan show up. Uh-huh. And they, they're just the old guy who have decided that, you know, like you killed the majority of my people, and now we're going to destroy all the Ultraman, and they're just, they're, they're the, the Daleks of Japan, basically. <laughs> but this episode really does stand out because of its creepy-ass Blue's Clues vibe with Ide that is not in any of the other Yeah. And never again does a character look directly at you and you're like, you're going to keep a secret for me, kids. <laughs> Why? Yeah. So anyway, that is it for this week's homework assignment. Okay. And, and I sincerely hope that your eyes, minds, and wallets have all been suitably open. But... Aha! You're not getting away that easily. Don't forget next week's exciting The Pope on Film homework assignment. And for next week, we are once again going back, 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 back to a previous homework assignment by once again doing another exciting round of dueling lists. Dueling lists. All right. Earlier... Earlier in the show, we touched upon the drama surrounding Richard Simmons. The truth is that A, no one knows what happened to Richard Simmons, and to B, discussing Richard Simmons has become very popular in American pop culture. So, dueling lists, the top ten things Richard Simmons might be up to. Okay. Next week we will be tackling Richard Simmons hard, and something tells me that's not the first time Richard Simmons had something hard tackle him. <laughs> If you know what I mean. Yeah. Plus, we'll be talking about pop-up podcasts because there was a popular podcast that appeared that it, it was just a podcast and it ran for like eight episodes and it only talked about what happened to Richard Simmons. That's how popular the Richard Simmons mystery is right now. Richard Simmons is getting a ridiculous amount of media attention right now. So really? that's what we're going to be talking about. The mystery surrounding Richard Simmons, pop-up podcast, uh, media attention, and dueling lists of the top ten things that Richard Simmons might be up to. Bunny will come up with a list, I will come up with a list, and we're going to be reading this together. It's going to be gold. So join us next week for another remarkably stupid homework assignment from the Pope on Film Podcast. (laughs) 